Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss Frozen Earths, the First Americans, three very important sisters, mighty empires, and magic plants. We're going to follow that outline right up above my little yellow box as we discuss the rise and fall of Native America. Now, one of the first things you need to realize is that the United States itself is constructed on the ruins of previous civilizations. Modern America is built on the ruins of Native America, pre-Columbian America. And this is more than evident in the archeological record of the United States. We have these ruins of ancient towns in the Southwest. We have great pyramids in central Illinois. And every time they do a you know, road project or they build these big buildings, they find arrowheads, broken pottery, mounds, stones, ceramics. They find the ruins of Native America. And to some extent, Modern America owes these people a tremendous debt. And in fact, I would argue that modern America owes it to Native Americans to learn about ancient Americans. And this is what we're doing in this lecture. And we're doing this in service of a single question, because we're always going to do this in service to a question. And that question is right there. The question is, Explain the geological and biological factors that made Native Americans vulnerable to deadly, virulent pathogens. What did Native American groups need to acquire to survive? Explain why groups that welcomed outsiders survived, while exclusionary groups that, that didn't welcome outsiders, while exclusionary groups did not. Did Native America sort of collapse on its own, or was it in fact destroyed? And finally, did Europe kill 40 million people. Now, we started with uh, the Age of Discovery. We've already covered the Age of Discovery, this period in world history where sailors and navigators and admirals and captains sort of sailed the earth looking for a replacement to the Silk Road. And in doing so, they discover a new world. They discover the Americas. But the thing is, is that there were already people in the Americas. You know, they were, Columbus didn't really discover anything. He merely connected the old world uh, to the new one. So where did these people actually come from? And people didn't know that. They thought maybe they had they were lost uh, a, a lost tribe of Israel. Maybe they were a lost son of Noah. Uh, maybe they were birthed from the earth itself. But the archaeology says that these very first Americans come from the end of the Ice Age. And the archaeology on the first Americans is very, very good. And there have been a number of very excellent books written about what we actually know, about what science says about the first Americans. And if this is the kind of thing that interests you, these are the books that I would recommend over there on the left. So, the current archaeological evidence indicates that the first Americans came from Northwest Asia, an area called Siberia, and they crossed into the Americas during the end of the Ice Age, an area, uh, a period known as the Pleistocene. Now, there are actually many different Ice Ages. The Pleistocene is the, is the most recent Ice Age. In fact, for most of the last five to ten million years, Earth actually kind of prefers to be frozen. Earth likes being kind of a snowball planet. And one of the more disconcerting things uh, you can kind of learn about the universe is that the Earth's orbit around the sun is not this kind of slow, stately, perfect oval, but rather the Earth flips around the sun like a drunk at three in the morning. And it kind of wobbles closer and it wobbles farther away from the sun, all the time. And these big wobbles are called Milankovitch cycles, and they determine whether the Earth is frozen or warm, whether the Earth is in an ice age or a warm age. And about, you know, 15,000 BC, the Earth, you know, one of these Milankovitch cycles changed, and the Earth wobbled a little closer to the Sun, and we transitioned from the Pleistocene, the ice age, into the Holocene, the warm age. But even then, it wasn't a smooth transition, but rather this kind of, kind of flip-flop back and forth. As the Pleistocene became the Holocene, you have this sort of climactic instability in the middle, where you have several centuries of warmth, and then several centuries of cold, and then several centuries of warmth, and then several centuries of cold. And this created a highly dynamic geology that was present throughout the Earth. And this absolutely seems to have affected the migration into the new world. Now, there are uh, many different theories about this, but the, the one that seems most convincing to me is the one I'm going to describe here. The fact that you didn't actually have a single passage uh, from Siberia 
into North America, but rather you had this kind of stutter shop, stutter stop passage uh, where not the entire route was not open at the exact same moment, which is why I've kind of constructed this kind of little diagram there on the lower left, because you had these warm and cold fluctuations uh, in Earth's climate. Now, for most of the Ice Age, the Earth was, of course, quite cold, and you had these huge glaciers, and these huge glaciers formed all this frozen water. They pulled all this water out of the ocean, and the, the sea levels of the world dropped. And this actually allowed a new land to emerge between Alaska and Siberia. And this land was called Beringia. So for most of the Ice Age, you could walk from Siberia across Beringia and to Alaska, but then you couldn't go any farther south because these two huge glaciers, the Cordilleran and the Laurentide Glacier, actually created this kind of wall of ice between Alaska and America proper. And that's the first kind of diagram you see on the top. You could walk from Siberia to Beringia to Alaska, but then you had to stop because there was no way to go south. But then the Pleistocene starts to come to an end and you have like a weird, a few centuries of warmth. And what happens at that point is that the earth warms, the glaciers melt, they dump all this water uh, into the ocean and the sea levels rise. And when the sea levels rise, this actually drowns the land of Beringia but it sort of opens a, a, a path through this huge ice wall. It opens an ice-free corridor. So that's what you have in the second scenario there below, where you could walk from Alaska through the ice-free corridor into America proper, but of course Beringia is underwater, so you can't actually go from Siberia to Alaska anymore. So it, kind of imagine it like a hallway with two doors, but the two doors are never open at the exact same time. And as the Pleistocene turns into the Holocene, it kind of does this open-close game for three or 4,000 years. Uh, and there's also a, a, a coastal route that's been argued. It hasn't been proven, but some people have argued that the people are sailing around the edges of the glaciers as well. And even that would create an even more restrictive entry into the new world. And because you have this sort of stutter stop geology at the end of the Ice Age, this creates the situation where you do not have a lot of migrants moving from Siberia to America proper. I mean, you don't have a lot of people crossing from Siberia into America proper. And, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to come up with numbers uh, of the migrants, but from what I've read from genetic variability, uh, it, it couldn't have been more than 100,000 people. In fact, it's probably less than 100,000 people crossed from Siberia into North America uh, while when the Pleistocene turned into the Holocene. And uh, we know this because we do not have a lot of genetic diversity present among Native American populations. So the, the geology, the Pleistocene, created a biological impact on these American migrants. And this migratory bottleneck created a really dramatic example of something called Founder's Effect. And I'm gonna give you the formal definition to Founder's Effect right now. Founder's Effect is, <clears throat> Founder's Effect is the biological phenomenon where the genetic diversity of a population is limited to the genetic diversity of the founders. So I'll say that one more time. Founder's effect is the biological phenomenon where the genetic diversity of a population is limited to the genetic diversity of the founders. Now, if you look at that little dot example at the top, you have the mother population can, is evenly divided between like purple dots and yellow orange dots. So there's a lot of genetic variability in the mother population. But if a group breaks away from the mother population to colonize like an island or an entire continent, and those colonizers, the founding pop, founding generation, consists of mostly yellow orange dots, then in the new population, you're not gonna have a lot of purple dots. You're almost gonna have entirely yellow orange dots. I'll use a, um, a sort of more practical example. We have an empty island in the middle of the ocean and we scoop up a thousand German shepherds and we drop a thousand German shepherds on this island. And, you know, assuming that they can survive on the island, we come back in a hundred years, we're not going to find Doberman Pinchers. We're not going to find Chihuahuas. We're not going to find Corgis. We're going to find an island full of German shepherds. 
because the genetic diversity of a population is limited to the genetic diversity of the founders. And this is true of, of all of biology, not just humans, but it is particularly true of humans. And in fact, this is a, a global phenomenon that is reflected in human biology, and it reflects the movement of humans away from our original homeland in Africa that the Middle East has less genetic diversity than Africa. Europe has less genetic diversity than the Middle East. East Asia has lower genetic diversity than the Middle East. The genetic diversity of Australia is less than that of Asia. Siberia has less than Asia. And as we move farther and farther away from Africa, genetic diversity drops. And Native Americans are simply the most extreme example of this. Basically, as the humans get farther away from Africa, the less the genetic diversity and the greater the genetic uniformity. In fact, uh, Native Americans are so genetically uniform that virtually all Native Americans have the exact same blood type. Somewhere between 80 to 100% of all Native Americans have type O blood. This is a map of, of type O blood frequency found throughout the world. And as you can see, there's a lot of variation in Africa, not a lot of variation in Native America. All right, virtually every Native American has the exact same blood type as every other Native American. Almost every Native American can donate a kidney to almost any other Native American. Uh, and this tells us that the original people, those handful of migrants that crossed at the end of the Ice Age, had type O blood. They almost had entirely type O blood. Therefore, there is no, there was no way for new genetic diversity to enter into these populations. Now, why am I talking about genetic diversity? Why am I talking about genetic uniformity? How can the geology, which created this biological uh, phenomenon, how is this going to impact American history? And the answer is very simple because genetic uniformity is not very good. And uh, for, to use an example, I'm gonna talk about bananas. I hope you like your bananas now because bananas, as we currently understand them, are going extinct. Now, bananas are basically, uh, uh, banana plantations are formed by cloning the uh, banana plants. They take a single banana tree and they take cuttings of this tree and they plant them. And what you end up with is tens of thousands of banana trees that are genetically identical to the planet, to the original tree that you took the cuttings from. So if you look at that picture right up above me, all of those banana trees are clones of an original banana tree. They are all genetically identical. Now this works uh, for large scale factory production of bananas that you can, you know, they all produce bananas that are the same size and the same texture and the same taste. And it's all very good. And you can go to the store and you're going to get the same banana on the same day because they are all coming from literally genetically identical plants. But the problem is this, this is the important bit. The lower the degree of genetic diversity, the higher the degree of vulnerability to infectious pathogens. That if you have a very genetically diverse population and they get hit with a disease, different members, different segments of the population are gonna react differently because they are genetically diverse. When you have a population that is genetically identical and they get hit with a virulent pathogen, they all react the same and the reaction can be catastrophic, which is to say about 20 years ago, a fungus figured out how to attack banana trees and this fungus is slowly killing every single banana tree in the world. That the current banana, as we understand it, will probably go extinct within the next two decades as these, you know, these, these fruit companies are scrambling with some way to save their banana trees. It's a doomed struggle. The lower the degree of genetic diversity, the greater the vulnerability to infectious pathogens. This is going to get really, really important. And this becomes the Achilles heel of Native America. Now, I'm not saying Native Americans are bananas. What I'm saying is that the exact same problem that is going to face Native Americans is the problem being faced by bananas today. It's the same problem that faced the Irish potato in the 19th century that throughout all of biology, the lower the degree of genetic diversity, the greater the vulnerability to infectious pathogens. Now, Native Americans spread across both continents and they form sort of the first great American culture, Clovis culture. Clovis culture, you can see from the map, uh, each one of those black dots is a Clovis culture site. And uh, so what is Clovis culture? Clovis culture is the first first American culture. 
and it can it is probably ancestral to all Native Americans. They were highly mobile, opportunistic hunter-gatherers, so we assume, and they are they're characterized by having these really large, beautiful stone bifaces that you can see right up above me. These are called Clovis points. They're big, they're beautiful, they could be spear points. I did read an argument that argued they are knives, they're big carving knives. Anyway, Clovis culture is the first American culture, and it exists right at the end of the Ice Age, from about 12,000 BC to about 10,000 BC. But they inhabit, you know, not America as we understand it, they inhabit Pleistocene America. And Pleistocene America is very, very different from the America that we have today. Pleistocene America is characterized by huge ice sheets, by massive rivers. The Mississippi was like 10 to 15 miles across. And even dinky little rivers like the Trinity River in Texas was like a mile or two across. Massive rivers because they're being swollen by the glacial melt. Most of Texas would have resembled northern Colorado. It would have been these huge, dense, wet forests. And the animals of the Pleistocene were absolutely massive. In fact, they are known as Pleistocene megafauna. This includes mammoths, mastodons, dilophants, giant horses, giant camels, giant ground sloths, woolly rhinoceroses. All of these animals inhabited North America, and we've found the remains of these animals from North America. And it's not just, you know, mammoths and mastodons, but you also have these Pleistocene mega predators. You know, American lions, dire wolves, saber-toothed tigers, and of course, the apex predator, this absolute monstrosity called a short-faced bear, which is basically take a grizzly bear, make it half again as large, and give it long legs because the short-faced bear would apparently run down its prey. Absolutely terrifying. The skull's like huge. And if you have some Native American in you, and if your family's been in the United States more than about four or five generations, you almost certainly do. If you have some Native American in you, these are your people. You know, you had a great, great, you know, 15,000 years ago great grandfather who stood on the hills of Texas and looked out at these huge wet forests to see, you know, a herd of mammoths crossing the southern plains, holding onto his spear with his big, beautiful Clovis point right on top. These, this was an America that we could only imagine what it looked like, but people experienced this America. But this America comes to an age. The, end, the Ice Age ends. Most of these Pleistocene megafauna die. Uh, in fact, exactly how they die is a subject of great controversy. And almost all of these Pleistocene megafauna die. The woolly mammoths are gone. The rhinoceroses are gone. The mastodons are gone. The giant horses are gone. There is really only one great survivor of the Ice Age, the American bison. There it is. And it's the easiest scientific name ever to remember. It's bison, bison. The uh, North American bison, which is also called, uh, which is often called a buffalo, even though it's like not technically a buffalo. Calling a bison a buffalo is like calling a chimpanzee a, a monkey. You know, it's not accurate, but like everybody knows what you mean. Now, uh, the American bison survives the end of the Ice Age. And uh, it survives the end of the Ice Age by basically shrinking a little bit. It loses about... 20 to 25 percent of its body mass and its horns go from really big to really small but still american bisons are quite large and because the american bison survives the end of the ice age they become the dominant animal of the western plains and massive herds of bison cross and crisscross the northern and southern plains and they become an incredibly important species uh, for native americans now native americans adapt they, they transform from these highly opportunistic hunter-gatherers of Clovis culture, and they specialize in all of the different terrains and in all of the different climates across the whole of North and South America. We're going to stick with North America for now. But if we jump forward to the year before Christopher Columbus arrives, if we jump forward to the year 1491, you know, some 11,000 years after Clovis culture, we have around... 50 million Native Americans, uh, people who exist in dozens of different societies with a wide degree of variation. And if you're interested in learning about like exactly what this incredibly populated Native American world looked like, I highly recommend Charles Mann's book on the subject, 1491, in which he looks at Native America just before Christopher Columbus arrives in the Caribbean. 
And there are lots and lots of different types of Native American societies. You have hunter-gatherers in California. You've got farmers in Texas. You've got fishers on the coast. You've got, you know, the, the farming communities of the South. You've got the hunters in the North. And down in Central and South America, you have very, very complex civilizations. But the problem is, is that when you talk about Indians, when you talk about Native Americans, this is what mostly pops into people's heads. You know, on horseback with bows and arrows, hunting bison with, you know, there's sitting bull over there on the left with, with the big headdresses of eagle feathers. And, and these people existed. They absolutely existed, but they are not all Native American societies. In fact, this was actually a, a minority of Native American societies. What the popular imagination, what the collective memory thinks of Indians is actually only a tiny subset of Indians that was actually formed in the 18th century. Most Native Americans were farmers, okay? They lived in villages, they lived in towns, they lived in cities, and they were farmers. But the farmer, they were also farmers who hunted on a regular basis. And what they farmed were the three sisters. The three sisters are corns, beans, and squash, usually planted together and in fact growing together. The corn would grow, the beanstalk would wrap itself around the corn stalk, and the corn would provide shade for the squash and the pumpkins growing at its base. And all three would be grown together, corns, beans, and squash. Uh, and generally consumed together, they make a pretty balanced diet. Now, down in Central and South America, they would eat tamales and tortillas. But when you get to the Indian societies of North America, generally they would eat the three sisters together in a dish that's known as succotash, corns, beans, and squash all cooked together in a, in a kind of mash. However, there is a problem with the three sisters, and it has to do with the most important and prettiest sister, which is corn. It's, it's like in every family. It's the prettiest sister that causes all the problems. Corn is a great plant. It produces a lot of calories. Corn produ can, it, it can, can survive frost. It can survive small periods of drought. It can survive kind of crappy soil. Uh, but the problem with corn is primarily nutritional, okay? That in the process of digesting corn tends to suck a lot of nutrients out of your system primarily iron. And if you have a, a diet that's primarily corn, you'll develop a lot of nutritional difficulties right off the bat. Most notably, you'll become anemic and you'll develop a skin disease called pellagra and your immune system starts to shut down. So basically, to have a balanced diet with the three sisters, you must include animal flesh. Animal flesh has to sort of supplement the diet and replace all the nutrients that the digestive processing of corn pulls out. This is why there are no vegetarian Native American societies, because all of these Native American societies get really, really paranoid about hunting because, you know, they don't know the nutritional science behind it, but they know if you don't eat meat with your succotash, you get sick. But the problem is, is that they don't have domesticated animals. The only universally domesticated animal uh, among Native American societies, you know, is the perito, the little dogs. You know, and these include Carolina hounds, these include chihuahuas, these include dogs of all kinds. But the problem with humans is that, you know, dogs are man's best friend. Very few societies actually eat dogs. Dogs are just too fun, they're too useful. Nobody wants to eat dogs. Dogs are too useful, okay? So what you do is you have to include meat in your diet and you don't want to eat your dog, so you have to hunt for it. So all of these Native American societies get really obsessive about hunting grounds. Now, based on the three sisters, you have very, very complex civilizations form. You have complex civilizations formed down in Central America. You have complex civilizations that form down in South America. And I really can only give you a bare survey of these civilizations as we move through. And we're going to start with the most complex of these civilizations. We're going to start with the Aztecs. Now, I'm going to give you three main points on the Aztecs. The Aztecs are over there. Their empire is in purple in that upper map. The first thing about the Aztecs I want you to know is that the Aztecs did not actually call themselves Aztecs. The Aztecs is what the other Indian societies of Central America called them. The Aztecs called themselves the Mexica. That's M-E-X-I-C-A, which is, of course, where we get the word Mexico. The Aztecs called themselves the people of Mexica. 
and they didn't really live in an empire. They had a single large political organization, you know, that's the thing in purple, but the organization wasn't really an empire. Uh, it was a triple alliance of three great city-states, the most important of which was called Tenochtitlan. So the first thing I want you to know about the Aztec Empire is that it wasn't really an Aztecs and it wasn't really an empire. The proper name for the Aztec Empire is the Mexica Triple Alliance. And the, and the second thing I want you to know about the Aztecs is that they ruled this Triple Alliance from the great city of Tenochtitlan. And there's Tenochtitlan because nobody knows how to spell it. And there is the great city of Tenochtitlan, an, artist, art, an art, artist's depiction of it right there. And Tenochtitlan was, in fact, this complete wonder to behold. It was built on an island or a series of islands. It had these bridges and causeways and canals. And when the Spanish show up in Tenochtitlan, it completely blows their mind. They've never seen anything like it. They liken Tenochtitlan to Venice or Constantinople because it doesn't look like really any other city in Europe. And they're just astounded by its cleanliness, its beauty, and the wonder of its goods. Because the third thing I want you to know about the Aztec Empire is that this great wealth and power of the Aztec Empire was based on its highly commercialized economy. They had, they had an entire district of the city was this huge marketplace. Everyone was buying and selling corn, beans, squash. There, there is even a, a, a fecal matter market where they turn uh, human poop into fertilizer to increase uh, corn yields. And uh, this is this sort of, this is why we go from a, the glittering wealth of the Aztec Empire and the Spanish destroy it and replace this incredibly commercialized economy with a very simple, extractive, feudal economy, which is how we go from the great wealth and glory of uh, the Aztecs to impoverished, broken Mexico, you know, 200 years later. So those are the three things I want you to know about the Aztecs. They were really the Mexica Triple Alliance. They had this incredibly wonderful city called Tenochtitlan, and they had an incredibly prosperous, commercialized economy. Now, we're going to move slightly to the east of the Aztecs. We're going to meet the Maya. And I'm going to tell you three things really quickly about the Maya. Now, the Maya in this map, they're the green. The Maya are in the green. First thing about the Maya is the Maya were never unified like the Aztecs were. There was never a kind of Maya empire. But rather, the Maya throughout their long history are characterized by autonomous city-states. Each one of their big cities was essentially its own country. And this is true, you know, for thousands of years. And the most famous of these Maya city-states is, uh, is depicted there on the lower left. It is the city of Chichen Itza. And, and there's a, a depiction of Chichen Itza uh, at its height. And it's, it's spelled right below me because nobody can spell tenor, uh, No one can spell Chichen Itza uh, either. So, one, the Maya are characterized by independent city-states. There's never a Maya empire. The second thing I want you to know about the Maya is they are, you know, as much as we can say this, they were probably the most advanced of all Native American societies. Now, what do I mean by that? The Maya were incredibly advanced. They had their own written language, and you can see elements of their written language right up above me. They had probably uh, the world's most accurate astronomical calendar. In fact, it's probably the most accurate astronomical calendar ever invented by humans. And they could very accurately predict the movement of the stars. They could predict solar eclipses. They could predict where Venus was going to be on any given day. Highly accurate calendar, which did not end in 2012. Um, and they had a, an incredible understanding of mathematics, up to and including the concept of zero and positional notation, which allowed them to add, subtract enormous sums, and even to some extent multiply and divide them in, in a kind of very, very crude form of algebra. So one, the Maya uh, were independent city-states. They were never a single empire. Two, they were incredibly advanced with their own written language, an advanced astronomical calendar, and an incredibly complex um, and effective sense of mathematics. And the third thing I want you to know about the Maya is the Maya have a really unusual, distinct, and incredibly beautiful art style. And it's quite unlike anything you see in the rest of Native America, and it's very rare in world history. And you can see this in the art right up above me, because Maya art is naturalistic. Maya art, people look like people. They sit in fluid ways. 
the Maya art involved a study of the human form that is almost unrivaled outside of Greece or Japan or China. I mean, look at the look at the art right up above me. We have a king. He's sitting on his throne. He's leaning on one side. It's a naturalistic pose. All of the people look different. We have a war captain presenting captives to his king. Each one of the captives is different. Each of them are named. And many of the depictions of art, many of these sort of classic Maya art images are themselves signed by the artist. And this is one of the reasons why Maya art is so incredible and so incredibly valuable even to this day. So those are the three things I want you to know about the Maya. They were autonomous, independent autonomous city-states. They were probably the most advanced Native American civilization, you know, advanced, with written language, astronomical calendar, advanced mathematics, and three, they had this incredibly naturalistic and beautiful art. It, people look like people. People look individually. It's not these big, blocky, autonomous symbols that you see. But the Maya and the Aztecs, along with the other uh, Native American people of Central America, had two magic plants. They had two really important plants that are going to play a major role in American history. The first of which is Mexican cotton, uh, Gossipium hirsutum. Native Americans domesticate cotton, uh, and it is vastly superior to the cotton that you find in the old world. And in fact, if you're wearing cotton right now, you are wearing the product of Native American genius. The, the people of the Native Americans of Central America domesticate cotton. It's got an incredibly high thread count. It's an incredibly resilient plant. It takes a lot of water. But cotton creates an entirely new tradition of cloth wearing, new tradition of clothes in Europe. And of course, cotton will absolutely have a major impact uh, on American history. And the other magic plant they have is the sacred weed, tobacco, uh, Nicotiano tobacco. The tobacco of Central and South America is very sweet. It's a very prosperous, uh, it's, it's a weed. And when you actually smoke it or snuff it, it affects the human nervous system in very unusual ways. In low doses, it's a stimulant. In high doses, it's a depressant. And in extreme doses, it becomes a hallucinogen. It's an antiseptic. It's an insecticide. It's a vermifuge. It's actually this incredibly, incredibly wonderful plant. It is also incredibly addictive and carcinogenic, so it will kill you over time. And you can't talk about early America without talking about the sweet tobacco of Central America. Now, moving down into South America, we come to the Inca civilization, this huge civilization that lived in the mountains of South America. And I'm going to give you three important things about the Inca. One, uh, the Inca were probably the largest and most powerful of any Native American state, period. And they had this huge empire, which occupied most of the western coast of South America, from the coast way up into the mountains. And they called this empire Tawatinsuyu, which means uh, the four corners of the earth. So the Inca are the largest and most powerful Native American society. Two, uh, the Inca didn't have a written language, but they had something that kind of mimicked a written language. They had these a tradition of, they had a knot language called a kipu, and there's a kipu on the lower left, and a kipu is a knotted cord, and exactly where you tie the knot on each of these strings indicates like a sound or a number. So they didn't, the Inca did not have a written language like the Maya did, but they had something that kind of served the place of a written language in the kipu. And the kipu themselves have only recently been uh, deciphered in the last 10 years or so. And now we've gotten to the point where we actually start to read some of these kipu that were seized by the Spanish uh, in the uh, 16th century. So one, the Inca were the largest and most powerful Native American empire. Two, they had this kind of not language with the kipu. And third, the Inca had a wider variety of foodstuffs to choose from. The Inca actually had domesticated animals. They had guinea pigs, they had llamas, and they had alpacas. And if you've seen Emperor's New Groove, that cartoon was supposed to take place in the Inca Empire. And in addition to the three sisters, you know, llamas, alpacas, they had probably what was one of the most important foodstuffs in the world because it's from the Andes where we get the potato. And the potato is going to dramatically change uh, world history. 
It's not just going to save Ireland, because it did, but it's going to expand to China, it's going to expand to Africa, because the potato is kind of this incredible food. You can almost live off potatoes alone. Now, we only have about a dozen or so uh, kinds of potatoes in the United States, but if you go down to Peru, if you go down into the old Inca areas of South America, you realize they've got like a hundred different types of potatoes. And the potato is absolutely going to change the world almost as much as cotton and tobacco did. But these complex societies like the Aztecs, the Maya, and the Inca, the complex Native American societies of Central and South America are not unique to Central and South America. We have complex Native American societies in North America, all connected through this vast trade network. But I'm going to talk about those guys in the next section, and I will see you there.